Welcome back everybody. In the last video we got the oil pump installed so now it's time to finish that out. Uh, I want to get that pickup tube with the front auxiliary suction bell put onto the engine today. And I've got two sets of these sitting out on the bench right now and as you guys uh, well know 1113's pickup tube and suction bell both uh, suffered some damage from some freezing water that was in the sump and I've made the decision I'm not going to repair these two pieces because I've got the corresponding identical pieces from my grandfather's old cat 5J2115. So I am going to set these aside. I'm certainly not going to throw them away. They would be fairly easy to repair and put back into service uh, one day. I just need to repair where that mesh got pulled out of the solder joint and then get this uh, fitting soldered back on to the end of that pickup tube. But we'll set those aside, store those away in the shed, and uh, there's just something I like about letting old 2115 live on, again, in a, in, even in, if it's just in a small way. Um, first D2 I ever bought, grandfather's old cat, lots of memories of him operating it from when I was a kid. The uh, front suction bell actually polished up fairly well. It's got a good mesh screen on it yet. And check the pickup tube over, and no cracks on either of the soldered joints, no leaks. The gasket surfaces look, uh, look pretty good, so that's the setup I'm going with. So I've got all the hardware laid out on the bench to install this assembly. Uh, the uh, front suction bell held on by two bolts and 1985-A uh, flat locks. I have pre-bent those two, makes assembly a little bit easier. And then the pickup tube is held to the bell with another longer 3 8 bolt, another 1985-A lock for that. And then the original setup for sealing under the head of the bolt is this kind of hard... Uh, almost a cardboard-like sealing washer with a backup little steel ring that goes behind it. Now, these are still available. I ran the part number through Florin, and I'm pretty sure you can get them through CAT, but honestly, you know, these things are too hard and dried up. They're too brittle to really ever seal again, so you really can't reuse them. And what I usually do is just replace them with a 5 16 flat washer and a circle made out of some rather dense but yet compressible paper gasket material. Those pieces are something I already have on hand. I really don't have to spend any money or wait for them to show up. And they do all the same, they do the exact same job as what that, uh, those factory original cat pieces accomplished. And you can see like this one here, got a little bit of rust on it, a little bit of damage. So none of those were really fit for reuse anyway. And then to seal the tube to the front bell, you have this copper washer that goes between the two pieces on that interface and all of the same hardware that also seals the pickup tube to the oil pump. And you can see nice little recess on each end for that copper washer to fit into. So what I usually do is uh, loosely assemble the pickup tube to the bell before I start putting it on the, on the engine. So start with getting the 1985-A lock on the bolt, followed by that steel flat washer, and then the paper compressible gasket bolt, and everything goes through the hole in the end of the pickup tube. Copper washer goes on the other side of the tube, down in that groove. Flip this over so they're oriented properly. And then I'll just uh, start that bolt into the suction belt and just kind of run everything up uh, hand tight. Just like that, everything can still move and flex a little bit. We'll take this over to the engine now. And I've got all the same sealing washers and bolt and folding lock on the pump into the tube. So just start that into the oil pump, just kind of hold everything in place. Set the bell down. And I'm gonna leave these two connections just hand tight for now because this is a situation where you don't want to fully tighten anything until you're ready to fully tighten everything. So we have the final two bolts with locks hold the suction bell down to the block. But I want to show you something here. Because they machined this, uh, this seat area for the bolt down into the material of the bell, we've got some high spots around the perimeter there and there. And same on the other side, high area right here, high area there. Um, that really creates a very uneven surface to pinch the lock down under the head of the bolt. And it really doesn't matter what you try and do, you always end up with a fold over lock that looks like this, all mangled because it's having to contend with high spots here and then the bolt in a low spot cramming it down in, you're having to fold it on each side. And there's just really no good clean way to get a lock in there 
without just mangling the heck out of it. So what I do to overcome that, this is my thing that I do. This is not sanctioned by the manual. This is, you don't have to do this, but it's something that I do because I'm kind of fussy and I like folding locks cleanly. I'll take a 5 16 flat washer. And yes, even though we have 3 8 bolts, if you go the next size smaller with a flat washer, it always fits around the threads much, much tighter. So the same thing would apply with like a 3 8 flat washer on a 7 16 bolt or a 7 16 flat washer on a half inch bolt. The next size smaller flat washer always seems to fit the bolts so much tighter. So put that little 5 16 washer there and then the bolt with the lock will go down on top of it. And when everything's tightened in, you have such a nicer, uh, flatter area for that lock to go on. Nice tight bends. Nothing's getting it mangled. You can tighten that in, and I think it's actually a more effective lock that way when it's got a nice flat surface beneath it to uh, be clamped down upon. And I'll do the same thing on this side. 5 16 washer, and then the bolt with the lock will go in on top of that. I'll just get these run down hand tight, and then all that's left to do is to perform the final tightening on all four of the fasteners, fold the locks, and make it permanent. Okay, forgive me, but I gotta show off the perfect run. We have first perfectly bent lock, boom, aligned just the way I wanted it. Second perfectly aligned lock, boom. And then to round them out, right on the money there, right on the money there. Gotta just, I love putting those things on. So much fun. And I love the fact that a couple of 2115's parts are gonna live on in 1113. Um, they might be a little more tarnished than what the 1113 lower hour originals were, but those things might as well be plated in gold in my world. Anyway, um, one thing I wanna touch on right here quickly, you can see this lock here, the way I positioned the fold down tab in a perfect world, you would have wanted it to be over here to resist any counterclockwise rotation at all. But if you look carefully at where the witness mark from the old oil pan gasket goes, I'll lay this ruler about right on it. That's about where the edge of the oil pan is going to run. And having the bent down portion of the lock on the front side of the bell was going to interfere with the edge of that pan and the gasket. Um, kind of a lesson learned from uh, experiences past. So. We put it around to the back side, nice, tight, sharp bend. It's not going to be able to find its way around that corner at all. So that pretty much concludes all the work that is under the front cover and beneath the oil pan. So let's move on to something else. Okay, engine front cover. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but there is a little bit of disassembly involved with it. Uh, we'll go through that right now. First step is to pry out the old front seal. We have a 1B5990, that is the part number in the manual as well. Old leather lipped seal, but that thing is just about armored the way they uh, fully enclosed it with uh, steel on each side. And you'll notice we have a rather deep flat machine surface in here. That corresponds with the reverse scrolls that are machined in, into the front of the crankshaft as well, just like what's on the back. And those are inboard of where the oil seal would run. Now, why do they put a seal on the front and not the back when they have the oil scrolls on each end? I really don't have the answer to that, but that's what they did. Next, I'll remove this rectangular cover. That uh, provides an access point to this governor control arm and this rod that also extends back. Um, this control arm in this area here where we have this little uh, roller on a bearing is what interfaces with the plug that's on the front of the accessory shaft and that is what exerts inward force on that plug while the flyweights are exerting their centrifugal force on it trying to push it out that arm and rod will extend up and go back through that opening on back to the injection pump to disassemble this just unpin that rod that will come right off. And we have a um, cup plug here sealing the, uh, the bore for this uh, cross shaft. And what you wanna do before you loosen the pinch bolt at the base of this, use it as a hammer and basically just tap out on that plug until it unseats and it comes out. It's, it's literally pretty much that simple. I've already done a, a run through disassembly on this to get it clean and everything, but that's exactly how you do it. At that point, we have another clover leaf lock under the pinch bolt, so you can loosen the pinch bolt or take it out completely. 
and you can then feed the shaft out while you work the lever off of it and withdraw both pieces. Now the last pieces inside this front cover are a couple needle bearings, one right there and one in there that that shaft pivots on. And um, all cat numbers aside, these are Torrington B1012 bearings. I plugged that number into Google and they're very common, widely available, and you should be able to get them for under $10 a piece if you need to replace them. The bearings in here are good, so I'm just gonna keep them right where they are. Um, also a good time to look at the shaft that pivots inside of them, and you want to watch out for witness marks like this one right here. Um, I can just start to feel those with my thumbnail. This side has similar witness marks, but can't really feel anything there yet. That's from those hardened um, little uh, needle bearings wearing into the shaft. And you'll notice the witness marks are all on the same side. You flip it over and there's nothing. The rest of the shaft is clean. That's because these typically wear on the bearings at the base, on the bottom, because gravity's pulling that whole assembly down. So if you uh, have a shaft that's, that's just lightly marked like this one, what I would do is just turn it around and put those witness marks up. For all intents and purposes, you've renewed the bearing surface. And it doesn't matter um, with the arm because the arm is not keyed to the shaft. This just has to be a pivot. It's not holding anything in time. So you can orient the shaft however you want in there. It's not going to make any difference at all. Last few words here before we put things together. Um, the only other thing to look for is to make sure that this roller still spins freely inside the arm. Uh, like I said, that's what acts on that uh, plug on the front of the accessory shaft. And if your bearing is uh, starting to get rough or that uh, roller is seized, you can uh, press it out. The shaft will press out of the arm. You can see it's been staked in on each side to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, but you can press that out. Um, they do list this, uh, this wheel and bearing. Um, separately from the uh, the arm itself, you can, you can even get the pin separate, so you just uh, replace all that, press it back together, and put some fresh uh, staking marks on there, and all should be uh, well. We also have a replaceable bushing in this end of the arm where that, uh, that rod pins on, so that helps to keep all your linkages tight. And uh, with governor components, you just really want to look for anything that's going to be like excessively loose on any pins or pivots or anything that has... Uh, rough spots or catches in it like uh, any potential uh, wear marks on this uh, the shaft where it pivots basically you want to keep everything in your governor system as tight as possible and as smooth as possible without catches without excessive slack without any you know rough operation that's going to help your engine run smooth idle well and uh, respond to throttle inputs properly so pretty simple to put all this back together just reverse order disassembly so I reassembled everything back into the front cover and I got the new front seal put in. Now, I want to tell you about this one real quick. That's that 1B5990 front seal. This is no longer available in any form through Caterpillar. So I had to go to an outside supplier. It crosses over to a CR or SKF, if you will, 17746. You can see we've even got it on there. It's got the CR prefix. Um, Quickly, specifications on that in case you want to try and find your own. Um, that is for a 1.750 shaft. Seal OD is 3.194, made for a 3.189 bore. And the 17746 was 0.313 wide. Although you have room for a wider one, this old one was more along the lines of 0.445, a little bit deeper bodied seal. But that should get you fixed up for a front crank seal on one of these D3400s. Looking at the back side of the cover now, uh, I made this gasket. This, again, is one that is not available from CAT anymore, and my bulk material was not wide enough to do the whole thing in one piece, so I did have to put a joint in it, so I did a little like a little puzzle piece uh, kind of a design right there to kind of help it uh, mesh together and keep from blowing out, and I'll just use the uh, usual sealer on this, and I'll make sure to fill that joint area right there should not have any leakage at all to worry about so and this is another gasket you want to very closely replicate the thickness of the original because of this flat machined area right here that is your thrust uh, surface for the idler gear in this area right here so you don't want to get that gasket too thin and mash that cover into that idler gear and, and start to bind things up 
that thing could run hot and then uh, gall the surface and really give you some problems in some short order. So uh, let's get the cover put on the engine. Okay, cover's ready to go on. Uh, gasket's in place, sealer has been applied. I've also uh, put assembly lube on all of the uh, critical contact areas. I have it on the end of the, uh, the plunger here on the accessory shaft where that governor arm is going to engage with it. I also have it on the idler gear hub. I have taken a brush and put a light coating on all of the gear teeth, on uh, all the timing gears. I know that's come up in the comment section a few times. They don't know why I left those dry. Well, it's one of those things where if you grease them up, right away when you put them in and then you you know have to step away from this project for like a week because this is a you know in between spare time project for me all those little pieces of dust and grit and everything that float around the shop are just going to come and stick to all that so i prefer just to leave all that dry until i'm ready to put it together um got some grease on the uh front of the uh, crankshaft where the front seal is going to contact and i've also put a little wrap of electrical tape around there to protect the seal lip from getting cut on the sharp uh, edges of the keyway Oh, what else do we got? I think that's about it. Oh, got some assembly lube on that portion. Yeah, there you see glinting in the light where that idler gear hub is going to contact. So, might as well quit talking and get something done. Need to feed that uh, control rod through the opening just above the idler, or sorry, the accessory gear. Carefully, carefully start that front seal onto the crankshaft. Pay close attention to alignment dowels. There, I've got the seal started on. Make sure we are properly meshed on that governor arm. There we go. couple bolts So the front cover went on well. One thing I want to mention quickly, I just did the final tightening on the pinch bolt and folded the lock. I left that loose so that I could be sure that everything was centered up with the accessory shaft before it was all made permanent. That's all well and good. So I think uh, I'm going to put the cover on here and we'll call it a day. Um, made this uh, gasket for the cover. That's an uh, eighth inch uh, cork rubber. It uh, needs to be a bit of a thicker gasket like that to cope with the uh, surface irregularities here. That's just rough cast. They never bothered machining that. So pretty easy gasket to pop out and make. I'll get this cover put on here and that'll pretty much wrap the video. Well, I must say I'm pretty happy with today's progress. I got that oiling system finished up and put the first of the covers onto 1113's new engine. Looking a lot cleaner on the front there. Just want to do one thing real quick. I'll grab a hold of this accessory shaft and we'll just do a quick backlash check. I can still see backlash movement on every gear in the train. So we know nothing's bound behind that cover, which is a good thing. So oil pan's going to be next. I got that right here. As you can see, there's Quite a lot of cleaning and prep work that's going to have to be done, and it's held on by like 8 billion bolts that are all going to have to be reconditioned, and threads cleaned, and uh, washers checked, everything like that. But that's going to be a job for another day. Uh, thanks again for watching, everybody. Hope to see you back again. 1113's engine is going to start gaining a lot of weight next couple episodes.